of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we gather together, to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your Summer, everything grows and sings. 
changes what comes out. God's word is rain pouring down on a land caught in drought. Pour out go, 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 go,
Thank you. 
men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. The angel said, stay here until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother. And they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. And then the 19th till 21. They returned to Nazareth. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said. Take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel, because those who were trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that um, as the song that we sang this morning, that you are God that speaks to us. So Father, here we are. I pray that we, our heart will be ready and the soul of our heart will be good. So any seed that's planted on it will, will bear fruit, will grow. So Father, I just want to pray to silence all enemies, all voices 
from our heart that keep us away and just be focused to receive from you, to hear you. And I pray for Pastor Matthew that you will bless him, that every word that's spoken through his mouth will be come from you, Lord. I thank you for your servant and I thank you that you bless him and anoint him. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. So we have finally left the 12 days of Christmas. That's behind us now. But uh, the story still continues of, of what God is doing in our world through Jesus. Uh, so we, we had a bit of that today. Um, just as a setup for this week and next week, we'll look at some of journeying with God, and this will go further, of, of how do we grow in, in intimacy, of knowing God better? How do we how do we journey with him through worship, through prayer, through service, through our interaction with one another? And, and how do we do that as individuals and as a community? We had a song this morning that mentioned or, or brings to mind this Bible verse of, I am yours and you are mine. When that comes up so often in the Bible, yes, there's a few times where it's that sort of personal pronoun, but God often uses it saying, I will be their God and they will be my people. And so it's this community idea that, that this intimacy, this getting close to God is not something that's only one-on-one -on -one in that respect, but is, is as a community, his people will, will be together. So we're looking at some of that, but this all centers on Jesus. So I want to start with things that I just find really cool, but are, I believe, worthwhile in us understanding how we're going to go further. So Jesus, in, in especially in Matthew's gospel, is presented in several ways because Matthew is trying to connect Jesus with the story of, of Israel, what God had been doing through these descendants of Abraham. And so the way he starts is really connecting Jesus with the whole story. It's like Jesus is reliving Israel's story in just the beginning. So in Matthew chapter 1, we start with this genealogy of like, this person was the father of this person, of this person, this person, this person, this person. And Matthew selects three major parts that he says, like, so Abraham. And then from Abraham, there's like 14 generations to David. And from then, there's 14 generations to the exile. And then from the exile, 14 generations to Jesus. And he, he spotlights these three parts because those were huge in Israel's understanding of itself as a nation. Abraham was, was the father of this nation called out by God. David was this great king, and God again gave great promises, and then this exile was, was the whole downhill of their country. Of We'd gone up, we had this great king, and then we were taken away, and during their exile, it was like, you're removed from your land, the temple's destroyed, the cities are destroyed, and so it's this really low point, but a very memorable one for their people. So you have Abraham who was the, the father of this nation and the father of a promised child, Isaac, the king, and then the exile. Well, then the next three stories that are all about Jesus are that Jesus is going to be this like miracle baby, this promised child, sort of like an Abraham, Isaac setup. And then we see the magi that come in, like we talked about last week, and they say, who's the one who's born to be the king? So we have connecting with David and the king. And then this week, we see that Jesus, as his family, has to flee to Egypt. It's a type of exile. So Matthew intentionally puts these in a way so that we can be like, oh, Jesus is like, he's reliving Israel's story and then is now going to take it further through the rest of the book. So that's one thing to understand. The second one is that Jesus is set up also in these stories, kind of concurrently, as a new Moses for God's people. So, some of the similarities. Moses was this baby that was saved from an evil leader, Pharaoh. Like, Pharaoh wanted to kill the babies, but Moses is saved from that. Then he eventually leads the people out of Egypt, so they came out of Egypt. And then they go from the water, the Red Sea, into the wilderness. And so that's Moses and the path he's leading his people. Well, Jesus' story. We have Jesus is saved from Herod, this evil king. That we didn't read quite that section this morning, but that's in between. Like, go to Egypt so that you can be saved from this king. And then, eventually, out of Egypt, I've called my son, which we read today. And then he's going to go from the waters of baptism, the Jordan River, into the wilderness of temptation, 
in Matthew chapter 3 and 4. So like Matthew has very intentionally been like, see, see, you, you know these stories. They're like, there's these pictures. Why is that set up? Well, for one, it's good for us to see, like, even Jesus understood the Bible in a way that, like, he saw himself in the story. And that's something I want us to, to realize. Like, when you read the Bible, kind of put yourself into that story. Um, we're not going to take everything from that way, but it's, it's valuable for us as we, as we think and as we read Bible stories to go, how do I kind of see myself living in that pattern, and then what can I learn of what should I do or what should I not do based upon how that goes to those biblical stories. So even Jesus had that, and we should see it. Uh, and then the flip side of how all these things led up to Jesus. There was just pictures pointing us to Jesus all along. And we should see that in our life, that all these things that happen to us is helping us see these pictures of Jesus all along. So, the wilderness part is what we'll look at a bit more today. What do you do when you're walking through the wilderness? Um, some of us, for the last two years with corona, probably felt like life was a bit like a wilderness. The, the streets are empty. There's not as many people walking around. Uh, you don't always get to see as many people as you'd want or... Or it's situations of there's ups and downs, and it's really nice at other points, but it feels really empty and sparse at others. Um, so hopefully learning from Jesus' example, but also how Jesus was shown in this picture of the people of Israel, I want to look at that example of what do you do in that wilderness? Um, so if we go back to the story of these Israelites that are being led by Moses, so like Jesus is sort of the Israelites and Moses at the same time, let's look at their story. They had been slaves in Egypt, been set free. They're no longer slaves. Uh, and, and they come to the Red Sea. They're being chased by Pharaoh. Uh, you've probably heard of this story or seen it in like the Prince of Egypt or Gods and Kings or various movies, uh, the, the Ten Commandments. But the, the people get to the water. There's the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea so they can walk through on dry land, but their enemies get covered over, the people are freed, and that's all happened within like the first 14 chapters of Exodus. Exodus chapter 15 is where we'll start today. We'll look at 15, 16, 17. Over this week, if you have the chance, read through all three of those chapters. I'm just going to skim along the top of them, hitting major points. So Exodus 15, we're told, happens three days after this huge miracle of being set free from slavery walking through a river on dry land, or a sea on dry land, uh, and then being saved from a huge army that's trying to attack you and kill you. I mean, uh, that would be like a really big moment. They had this huge party, and there's lots of singing and dancing that goes on in Exodus chapter 15 at the beginning. Like, yeah, God is good, God is good. Three days later, they come to some water, and they taste it, and it's bitter. And they name the place like bitter water, Mara, bitter. And they're like, we should have just died back. Why did we come here? What's the whole point? Why are we in this place? This is horrible. There people like three days ago, God does incredible, amazing thing using water, right? This miracle in their life. And it takes them three days to be like, oh, this is stupid. Why are we here? I don't want to be here. We shouldn't have ever come here. We can so quickly lose perspective. And the people are, are given these two choices. Will they grumble or will they trust? When you're, when you're going through the wilderness, I think that's a question for us to realize. Will you choose to grumble or will you choose to trust? Will you choose to be like, I don't like what's going on? Or will you choose to say, God's been with me before. God's going to be with me again. So this week... I had a fun example of this happen in my own life with my children. Uh, we were up in Amsterdam for a few days visiting Oma, their grandma, uh, and their aunt and their cousins who are the similar age. So my sons love hanging out with their cousins. And on Thursday morning we got up and we were going to be traveling back. So we said, hey, you guys need to go play outside 
this morning because we're going to be getting in the cars and you'll be sitting for a long time. Let's play outside this morning. And we're pushing them to play outside in the morning. They're like, oh, I don't want to play outside. I want to play inside. I have all these other things I want to do. And, and my, my sons and the cousins are all together. Like, I was like, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. No, we need to make sure that let's get you cleaned up. Let's make sure you've used the toilet. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And then it's still, we're going to be getting into the van because they live in Amsterdam. We live in Maastricht. We're going to Maastricht. We'll have to drive. No, but I don't want to leave them. I want to stay here with all my, my aunt and my cousins. And, and there's tears that are just streaming down all of these children's faces. <laughs> And the best ones are the ones that have glasses. Because when you have glasses on a child and there's tears streaming, like they start pooling up and it just makes it all the more vivid. It's, it's kind of fun to watch, I admit. But they're crying and it's horrible. Oh, no, why? Why do we have to go back to Maastricht? I want to stay here. And it was, it was grumbling. But at one point, my, my oldest son David and I were on, on the side doing something and David had been unhappy. I said, David, trust me, this is going to be good, and you're going to like the outcome. I didn't tell him why he would like the outcome. And as far as he knew, absolutely nothing had changed. We live in Maastricht, cousins lived in Amsterdam, and we were going to be driving back to Maastricht all of those things were still the same. But I had stopped and asked my son to trust me, to understand that his parents are working for his best interest, for his good. But I didn't explain anything else to him. But he calmed down and, and was doing better. And the other kids who had not had any of this were not reminded to trust their parents. Were like, ah, no, no, why is this happening to us? I don't want to leave, I don't want to leave. We get into the elevator. Get out of the elevator. I don't want to leave. And it was the most dramatic time of leaving that we've had in their like eight years of the oldest one. They get to the cars, they start hopping in the respective cars, my kids in my car, the her kids in their car. But then we say, oh no, getting in the wrong vehicles. We're gonna switch things up. And some of her kids are gonna ride in our car, and some of our kids are gonna ride in their car. And hey, what's happening? And uh their aunt asked them, like, oh, why do you think we might not be getting all into separate cars in that way? And I appreciated how my, my oldest nephew was like, well, there's two options that are logical. Either we're all going to Maastricht, I mean, that would be a logical option. Or, I mean, we might still be just doing, driving in Amsterdam because you're going to have to go kind of around our place to go out. So maybe at least we get to ride together there. Both of them are logical. I'm not sure which one it is, but it could be one of two options. And I thought, man, this kid has none of my blood genetics at all. <laughs> but man, I, I like this kid. He's kind of like me. And we said, we're all going to be going to Maastricht together. And we had decided that. The moms actually had decided this. And thought it would be fun to surprise the kids without telling them. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, like, all the tears led up to this moment of, like, Oh, this is great. And one of them said, that's why there have been all these problems today. <laughs> and then he has a smile on his face. And it's gone through this whole like breakdown moment to get to, oh wait, that's what they're always, my parents weren't being horrible to me. Do you do that with God? where we complain, why is this, this bad, that bad things, all these bad things are happening, why, and this is horrible, and I hate doing this, and why did I do this in the first place? And then you get to a moment, oh, oh, it's all okay. That's what all the problems were for. I can't tell you all the times why God doesn't explain to us what he's doing. Why is the like, well, if you knew I was really sad, you could have just told me I was driving the monster, it didn't be fine. Sometimes there are reasons that parents, our Father in Heaven, doesn't let us know. But what I can tell you is this. Your situation doesn't need to change before your attitude does. As I said with David, like, nothing had changed about the situation as far as he knew 
But his attitude was able to change because he could trust that there's going to be something good happening. So we get to choose. Are we going to trust or are we just going to grumble? You can keep having a grumbling attitude and hate everything about the wilderness. Or you can choose to trust. And that doesn't mean that you deny that it's tough. It doesn't mean that you deny that it's pain. It doesn't mean that you stop asking for something different to happen. We see all of those happen in Jesus' life, where he has tough moments and can talk to his father and say, can this pass from me? But not my will, but yours. I will trust you despite the difficulty of a situation. If Jesus could do that, and he's our example, Let's be one who chooses to trust instead of grumble. So that's Exodus 15. Exodus 16 is now about a month and a half later. So 45 days after huge miracle first, huge miracle at uh, the Red Sea. And I didn't mention. So at Marah, this place of bitter waters. Then God says to Moses, after all the grumbling has happened, God tells Moses, take, take a tree branch. Throw it in the water, and the bitter water will become sweet. Takes a tree branch, throws it in the water, and then they're able to drink from it, and it's perfectly good. What changed? A uh, stick of wood was thrown in. God does this, this miracle, and is it meant to be a foreshadowing of how the, the wood of Jesus' cross and what would happen there would be able to change our situations from bitter to sweet? Perhaps worth considering at least. But God has done a miracle for them there. We're told then after they've been at Mara, they've been able to drink the water. They get to another uh, place that has palm trees and good water. So God's been providing for them. And then 45 days later, they're complaining again. Why don't we have any food? We want more food. Food would be so good. I just want food. We're in the desert. I don't want to eat sand. Have you ever had sand in your mouth? It's so annoying. They're like, why did God do this to us? Why are we here? I want food. They have the choice, again, to grumble or, or trust. That actually happens in all of these chapters. But then there's extended. So God says to Moses, I will provide my people with food. There's going to be quail, so you'll get to have some meat, and those will come in in the night. But then in the morning, you're going to have this food that's out on the ground. It's like, it'll come with the dew of the day, and it's these little, like, white wafer things, and they named it manna, which means, what is it? Like, it's not, I, I don't know what this thing is, but you, you're able to gather up all these little, like, wafers, and you can boil them, you can bake them, you, you can do several things, but you, you'll have food. So people are like, uh... The next morning, they wake up, and there's all these little wafer things on the ground. They go out, and they grab them, and they get them, and it's cool to me, the only thing we're really told about their flavor is they taste a little bit like honey. And why I like that is because God had promised to send them to a land of milk and honey, which was this picture of abundance. You'll have tasty, sweet, good, nourishing things. But along the way, I'm going to give you like this little foretaste. These little things that apparently white like milk taste a little bit like honey, and you're like, well... This is reminding us what God is sending us toward. I'll give you these little like nibbles along the way. But God said, I'll give you enough. I'll put it down that day. Eat whatever you can that day. Don't try to keep any for the next day. Because I'll make sure you get enough every day. So it's showing up on the ground. They gather it all up. Some people bake it. Some people boil it. They eat it that day. Some people start to speculate, you know, there's extra on the ground. How about I get more? Why do this day by day? God said, do it every day. I'm just going to do extra today. And so some people made extra so that they could have it left over. So tomorrow morning, they don't have to go outside. The next morning, they wake up, and what they had left over is maggot infested, and it stinks horribly. And I don't know exactly how Moses finds out. Maybe Moses is just like walking through the camp and maybe he has a really good nose where like his olfactory glands are the same as like my wife's who are just like so much better than mine are. Like she can smell stuff 
much before I do. Maybe Moses is that way. He's walking around. What is that smell? I don't know what you're talking about. No, it's really coming from this tent. What is wrong with this tent? And I'm like, why did you keep over extra manna? God said, really simply, don't take extra manna because there's manna out on the ground every day. Why did you disobey? Um, they're like most kids. I don't know. Along the way, as you go through the wilderness, I'm not saying everything will feel like simple instructions, but sometimes they're just really simple instructions of how we can obey God. And the question will be, do we just simply obey? Or do we try to seem like we're so smart and figure out, huh, I can, yeah, I know what I can do. I can do this better than what God told me to do. He said one day, I'll get several days. It'll be fine. And Moses, simply obey what God has told you. But after a few days, God says, oh, by the way, I don't want you to have to work on the Sabbath for, like, gathering the food. So I'm going to make it special that on Friday, get enough for two days. So I know what I said earlier about the other one. Like, every other day, only get for one day. But on Friday, gather enough manna for two days and make it. And the next morning, it'll be fine. It'll be good. So Friday comes around, a lot of people gather enough for two days, but some people, it's like, shows up every day. There's nothing scientifically different about a Friday than a Saturday. So let's just get what we want for Friday. I'll wake up early on Saturday and get some more. Saturday morning comes around. Some people are just chilling in their house. Moses, I'm guessing, is just hanging out in his tent. And then he sees other people that are like all wandering around being like, ain't no food on the ground. What's up with that? And he sees them like, what are you all doing? Or maybe some came to him, I don't know. But he sees them and he says, why are you looking for manna on the ground? Didn't, didn't I tell you what God told me? That Saturday morning, there's not going to be any manna on the ground. Get enough on Friday. People are left speechless again. And if I were Moses, I'd be like, simple instructions. Simple instructions. But will we follow it up with simple obedience? When you're going through a wilderness, there will be some of those times that's like, okay, this is how God asks us to live. Let's do that. Exodus 17. There's again complaining that's going on. This whole like grumble or trust thing shows up again. But instead of the people as clearly saying, why did the Lord do this? They start, instead of blaming God, they just start looking at it from a very human perspective. So they're coming at Moses being like, Moses, why did you lead us here? It would have been better if we'd stayed back in Egypt as slaves because slaves are still alive. Dead people, they just dead and we're going to be dead. And so they're grumbling and complaining again. And Moses is like, okay, God, what do I do? Because they're saying, we don't have water, we don't have water, what do we do? God has been able to make water go from bitter to sweet. He's been able to make water go from like down to the sides and then back again. Why do they doubt? Why do they choose not to trust? God tells Moses, take your staff and other leaders of Israel, have them go out with you. So Moses doesn't go along, but he goes with various leaders of Israel. They go up to a rock. He hits the rock, and water starts coming out. And again, this seems like there's a bit of a, a picture of Jesus, like when Jesus is like stuck in the side with the spear, like there's the water that flowed from him. And this picture of Jesus' death would bring about salvation for everyone, which in that moment, the Israelites would not have been like, in like 1,500 years, this is how it's going to go. They didn't see it clearly going ahead, but looking back, we go, oh, I see a pattern of what God's doing. But the people chosen, many of them chose to blame Moses and say, oh, this is Moses' fault, until they have water freshly again. and like, oh, now I trust God. Oh, now I'll stop complaining. Now I'll start drinking water again. This will be good. So there are some that blame. But then at the end of chapter 17 is also this really cool picture of people who choose to support their leaders instead. 
So there's a, a foreign nation that are like, we don't like having these people walking around close to us. And so the Amalekites start to attack the Israelites, and there's this battle going on. And Moses goes up on the mountain, and he's like holding his staff up, and um, I don't know how they found out that like when he's holding his staff up, our people are winning, and when he lets his staff down, our people are losing. We're not told if like God tells him, hey, go up there, keep the staff up, and you'll keep winning. But somehow they find out. Staff up, staff down. Staff up, staff. okay, stop doing that staff down thing. <laughs> so he's holding his staff up and keeping his arms up, but Moses eventually gets tired holding his arms up. I don't know if you've ever just like stood with your hands up. And it seems, oh, this is easy. I can do this. And then like five minutes later, you're like, oh, okay. If you keep doing that for like 30 minutes, an hour, like, you know, I was like, oh, I just want to set him down. But there are two other guys, one of them, Moses' brother, Aaron, uh, another one, uh, Her. <laughs> this guy, but his name is Her, like H-U-R. And, and these two then are up there helping Moses. And first they're like, hey, let's move this rock underneath him so he can at least sit down. So I don't know if like, Moses is like, trying to do squats and stuff. <laughs> like, okay, still winning, still winning. But Moses sits down on the rock, and then eventually they're just holding Moses' arms up. Instead of being like, hey, Moses, get out of the way, let me do it. They're, they're supporting Moses in this process, as Moses is supporting the people, Joshua and, and the military, that are trying to protect their whole nation. And so at the beginning of the chapter, you have this picture of those that choose to blame, and at the end, you have this picture of people who choose to support instead. To me, that's also been uh, an interesting or is a cool encouragement as I looked at that this week because I have felt like it's good for more people to step up in, in our church and take certain roles of uh, leadership and, and support and service. And two of the guys that I've spoken to this year are Villain and Blaze. And the, they're going to be helping out more sort of coming on church staff as, as we go through so I was like, oh, hey, this is cool. There's like two guys helping out Moses. And they're like, two guys going to be helping out me. I'm not saying I'm the new Moses. That was Jesus. But still, like, some of these pictures of this seems like we're going in a good direction. Of, of more and more of the, the support of the community uh, as we help each other. Because the goal isn't just that one person gets put forward. Even with that one, it wasn't like Moses needs his arms up for his own good. It was... We're supporting Moses so that he can be a better support to all the people. This is for our, our, our nation that we're helping. So hopefully, as we also do that as a church, it'll be something that's good for the whole church. Um, and then, as part of this whole battle, or at the end of it, the people give God, a, like, they add to the names that they call God. And they start calling him also, the Lord is my banner. And I like that picture of the Lord is the one who's kind of over us. He's going forward. He's, he's the one who gets seen. Like if you see a parade and there's a banner, you read what's on the banner because it's like we're, we're lifting something up so that it gets the attention. And for us, the Lord is our banner. He's the one who should get attention and we're there helping to lift him up and supporting the Lord instead of blaming the Lord as well. So, just a quick question as we look at how do we work towards intimacy or how do we live more and more with intimacy, uh, sort of like an intimacy indicator of how you're doing with God is do you remember who God is? When it was between grumbling or trusting, my son stopped grumbling when he remembered who his father was and what his father would do for him. Even if he didn't know exactly what that looked like. Same with you. Can you trust God, not knowing what might be all of the outcomes, but knowing God is good? With choosing to obey versus speculate. Do you remember that God is smarter than you? A lot of times, I've seen a lot of people, myself included, who don't act like it. But if we actually stop and remember who God is, that changes how we live. 
and with blaming versus supporting both God and the other people he's put into our lives. And again, do we remember that God has the authority and the power and he has the right to lead us because where he's leading us is good. From just a, a personal note on like personal relationships, if there's someone that I know, like they don't really listen to me or don't really value me, then I don't feel as close to them. But like, intimacy comes when you feel like someone really knows you. They know your heart. They know the kind of decisions that you would make. Just because it was funny last night. Um, we were at some friend's house and uh, someone had made mutton biryani. It's delicious, like, Indian meal, mutton biryani, but they had forgotten uh, to bring yogurt or didn't have yogurt with them. So they called ahead and said, oh, can we have some, uh, can, can you guys go pick up yogurt? So yeah, it's easy, I went to the store and I bought two different things of yogurt. I bought like a, a big thing of just like plain Greek yogurt, full fat yogurt. And then I bought like a little cup of like a fruit yogurt thing. I thought this would be funny. Walking in the house, I like kept the other yogurt away, like the, the big thing of yogurt, and just played into this cultural stereotype of Americans not understanding much. Just like set the little fruit yogurt cup, I'm like, oh, I got some yogurt, that way it can go along with our uh, biryani, it's gonna be great. And, and, and like the husband did a really good job of keeping a straight face. And he's just like, oh, is that, uh, that might not be enough. Is the place close by? Maybe I can go. I'll just go get more. But Christine knows me too well. And so she's like, that's not like you. Where, 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 where is it? And like she starts like grabbing at my jacket to be like, where did you hide this other yogurt? That cannot be the yogurt that you would bring for this. You know Indian food well enough what kind of yogurt you should have. She knew me, and so even something that seemed so strange and out of character and like going the opposite direction of what was desired, she's like, no, I, I know you too well. No, okay, okay, I've got the other yogurt, and there's like look of relief on the face of the Indian family. Can we do that with God, even in the moments where it's not just funny that it's a little yogurt cup? It's like, God, why did you just put a yogurt cup here? That is absolutely not what I asked for. Can we say, God, I know you too well, so that whatever you're doing, this isn't because you hate me, this isn't because you're trying to ruin my life, this isn't because you don't want my good. Whatever you're doing, I'll play along. Those are ways that we start to realize that our intimacy is growing with God. So we can have moments of like, I would normally have been super disappointed by this, or I would be freaking out and anxious right now, or I would be so whatever. But now, I'm not saying I like the circumstance, but I know God's got it. That's a good indicator that your intimacy is growing. So I, I want to give you some time to discuss some of this. Um, which of these kind of three things is hardest for you? Is it hardest for you to trust God instead of complain? Or is it hardest for you like, well, yeah, I trust God's going to do something good. That doesn't mean I'm going to do what he told me to. And is it that, like, to speculate how you should do it versus just obeying God? Or is it, is, between me and God, it's good, but other people, shh. I blame them for everything instead of supporting them. But let me pray first, and then we'll have those short discussions. Heavenly Father, thank you for being the one who's telling this really awesome story. I know you're a good storyteller. And I've seen that in my life, that what you're writing isn't always easy, isn't always what I want. But I know I can trust you and what it is you're trying to do um, in my life and in the lives of people around me. 
So God, I pray we would come first off with trust. And then that all these other things would, would grow along with it as we grow in you. Thank you for being so patient with us, God. You know we don't learn everything always the first time the best, but throughout our lives you're forming us and you're shaping us. May we keep growing so that we'll be more fruitful, more, more strong, more loving, more gracious, more humble throughout the process of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> the end of the story, I'll come up from the wilderness. I'm leaning on my beloved, I know the end of the story, I'll come up from the wilderness. I'm leaning on my beloved, I know the end of the story, I'll come up from the
you today. Nothing that could happen to you today could separate you from the love of God. You can trust Him. And you can obey Him when He asks you to do something. And you can support Him and others along the way. So may you go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. With the love of that Heavenly Father. The friendship of the Holy Spirit going with you, filling you up for each day. May you have a blessed Sunday, may you have a blessed week. Looking forward to seeing you again.